Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. As you Chooms already know, other hair loss witchers will often ask me to do a video on a particular subject that I haven't covered yet. I know some people will get frustrated that they have asked several times about me covering a specific topic that I haven't done yet. I actually have a research folder where I keep a list of suggested topics, and it is a very long list. I can only do one video at a time, though, but rest assured that if you follow my channel, then eventually I will get to all the topics you are interested in. So one topic that several people have asked me about over the years is the subject of shampoos. Specifically, people ask what kind of shampoo do I use, and are there some ingredients in shampoos that they should avoid? One ingredient that comes up a lot in the discussions is sodium lauryl sulfate. In case you don't know, sodium lauryl sulfate, also known as SLS, as well as a related substance called sodium lauryl sulfate, known as SLES, are two closely related chemical foaming agents that are used not just in shampoos, but also in other products like soaps, detergents, makeup, even toothpaste and mouthwash. So, it's the thing that makes shampoos and other cleaning products foam and lather up. That's why oftentimes the overpriced Crunchy Mom shampoos you see at Whole Foods don't lather very well because most of them are SLS free. Technically, both SLS and SLES are classified as anionic surfactants. Their chemical structures are pretty similar. Both SLS and SLES work because their molecules have a water-attracting end and a water-repelling end. They work by reducing the surface tension between two substances, which allows them to mix together better. This reduced surface tension also allows air to get trapped in the water more easily, which causes foam formation. So, these chemicals are often used in shampoos to increase their foaming action. Anionic surfactants also surround dirt and grease and form small clusters called micelles that can be washed away easily. So, they are frequently used in household cleaning products, including shampoos. So, I was originally going to lump sodium lauryl sulfate and sodium lauryl sulfate together in this video, but unfortunately, I can't do that, and that's because the two agents have different properties. Sodium lauryl sulfate is derived from sodium lauryl sulfate, and it is actually more commonly used in shampoos than sodium lauryl sulfate because it is milder than SLS. However, SLES may have some toxicity that SLS doesn't have, but we'll get into that later. So, if you look online, it's easy to find websites proclaiming that SLS is bad for your hair. Some sources say it can cause inflammation or dry out your hair excessively, and some sources even make more dire claims, like that it can cause cancer. Most often, these claims come from companies selling shampoos and other products that don't contain SLS. It kind of reminds me of companies that bash finasteride, but just so happen to be selling their own bullshit hair loss products. Hair guard, I'm looking in your direction. So obviously, there is a lot of bias in the messaging about SLS online, just as there is with finasteride. But to be fair, there is some bias on the other side too. You can see a lot of the positive information on SLS coming from sites that have a vested interest in people buying products containing SLS, like this site here sponsored by Colgate. So all this has created a lot of confusion for consumers, which has left me with no choice but to activate my Witcher senses to find out once and for all what the truth is behind sodium lauryl sulfate and sodium lauryl of sulfate. Are these foaming and cleaning agents harmful, beneficial, or are they merely neutral in their effects? So, let's first start with the most serious claim, that sodium lauryl sulfate causes cancer. This claim is made by many people, including notorious health scammers like the fake doctor Scientologist Eric Berg. But the question is, other than that, is it toxic to our bodies? Well, here's the data that I researched. It may be contaminated with two toxic chemicals. One is ethylene oxide, which is a known human carcinogen, and 1,4-dioxane, which is a possible human carcinogen. So Mr. Eric Berg is claiming that SLS is potentially contaminated with carcinogenic compounds, including ethylene oxide and 1,4-dioxane. This is a half-truth, though. Sodium lauryl sulfate is not contaminated with either of these compounds. Sodium lauryl sulfate is produced by mixing lauryl alcohol derived from coconut or palm oil with an acid. So no carcinogens are involved in its processing, though I have to say that it is still disturbing that SLS is sometimes derived from palm oil because the use of palm oil is one of the major causes of deforestation in the world with major effects on climate change too. So health effects aside, there are definitely some environmental and ethical issues with SLS use. So palm oil definitely sucks, not just for that reason, but also because it is one of the vegetable oils with the highest amount of saturated fat. So for anyone who watched my vegetable oil videos and thought I was too pro vegetable oil, palm oil is one vegetable oil or fruit oil that I will never use. Nevertheless, sodium lauryl sulfate does not contain any carcinogens. However, when it comes to sodium lauryl sulfate, which is commonly found in hygienic products, including shampoos, that is definitely a different story. 
Sodium laureth sulfate can be contaminated with potentially carcinogenic substances, specifically something called 1,4-dioxane, which the fake Dr. Mr. Berg brought up earlier, which is classified as being possibly carcinogenic in humans. Sodium laureth sulfate is derived from sodium laurel sulfate by a process known as ethyl oxidation, and 1,4-dioxane is produced as a byproduct of this chemical process. Now, manufacturers of products containing 1,4-dioxane can strip it out of their products. The FDA over the years has monitored the amount of of 1,4-dioxane in personal care products, and the amount has gone down over the years. In 2018, only 2 out of 82 products tested had 1,4-dioxane levels over the supposed safe upper limit of 10 parts per million. The EPA monitors 1,4-dioxane in the environment, but not specifically in personal care products. There is no federal law limiting 1,4-dioxane in products. But two states, New York and California, have passed laws severely limiting acceptable 1,4-dioxane levels in personal care and cleaning products down to less than one part per million. So usually state laws like that affect products across the whole country, just like anti-pollution laws in California are adopted by all auto manufacturers universally just because they're such big states. Of course, based on the current political climate in the United States, it's definitely possible that all these regulations may just disappear in the next few years or so, in which case no no one will be able to vouch for the safety of any of these products, but at least we'll have the freedom to poison ourselves without government interference. So, Mr. Berg, as usual, is being misleading about sodium lauryl sulfate causing cancer. He is confusing sodium lauryl sulfate with sodium laureth sulfate. But then again, we are talking about a guy who claimed that jello can stop hair loss, so maybe we shouldn't have very high expectations of his scientific literacy to begin with. And since I brought that up, I'll link my Worst the Hair Loss Industry video about Mr. Berg below in the description, and I highly encourage you to watch that video when you have the chance just to see how big of a dumb dub Mr. Berg really is. But even looking at sodium laureth sulfate, it seems like the risk is too low today because of regulations aimed at the personal care and cleaning products. So let's just go ahead and focus on sodium laurel sulfate for the rest of the video. Well, I mentioned that there are a lot of websites that are either for or against SLS that are biased because they have products to sell. That's even true of the medical literature on SLS. One of the most extensive review articles on SLS is this one right here. It is on the safety of SLS in household cleaning products, but most of the authors of the article work for the company's seventh generation, which makes products containing SLS. Nevertheless, this article is a systemic review of the literature, but it does seem to minimize some of the risk of SLS to the environment. Fortunately, there are some articles about SLS that don't have any conflict of interest, like this one here, as well as others that I'll link below in the description. So, rather than go through each article separately, let me try to summarize what I've learned, or actually, let me rephrase that, what I know about SLS. So we've already talked about the exaggerated cancer risk, which doesn't even apply to SLS, so let's go ahead and look at the other risk. Acutely, the major side effects of SLS are skin irritation and eye irritation. You know this if you ever get shampoo containing SLS in your eyes because it stings. Anti-SLS sources sometimes claim that SLS can cause permanent eye damage and blindness. This was based on a study that showed high concentrations of SLS can slow the healing of injuries to the eye. However, this study did not suggest that normal exposure to SLS causes eye injury. And in fact, the author of the study responded to the anti-SLS distortions by accusing them of libel. Similarly, there was an experiment in which the lens of the eye was immersed in a concentrated SLS solution, and this resulted in cataract formation. But this is another artificial situation that doesn't reflect the brief exposure to SLS when it gets in your eyes while shampooing. If you don't like SLS in your eyes, don't let the foam drip down your face while showering. It's as simple as that. As far as skin irritation goes, this definitely can occur. It's caused by water loss in the outer layer of the skin called the stratum corneum, but it is completely reversible. As it turns out, this effect on the skin is not all negative even. Surfactants like SLS actually increase the absorption of drugs through the skin. So it's possible that based on this mechanism, applying minoxidil right after shampooing with an SLS shampoo could actually increase the absorption of minoxidil. That would put all these microneedling salespeople out of the job. I couldn't find any studies that looked at this, which is too bad because the mechanism does make sense. But since this is my theory, I think research on this study should be done, and I was going to start a study like this personally, but unfortunately, due to recent political events, all the NIH grants here at the Hair Cafe Institute of Advanced Hair Loss Research have been cancelled, so this is a study that will probably have to be done in good Korea. Anyways, getting back to the possible toxicity of SLS, since we know SLS is found in toothpaste and mouthwash, is it possible that this can cause health problems due to its toxicity? 
Well, oral toxicity is defined scientifically by the LD50, which means the lethal dose that kills 50% of animals. For SLS, the LD50 in rats ranges from 600 to about 1300 milligrams per kilogram. So that may sound like SLS is dangerous to ingest, but even something like table salt has an LD50 that isn't much higher at 3000 milligrams per kilogram. This is considered safe by the FDA because the FDA has approved SLS as a food additive. It is sometimes listed as an ingredient by another name called sodium dodecyl sulfate, but it's actually the exact same thing as sodium lauryl sulfate. I think this is just a marketing decision because people would probably be freaked out if they saw an ingredient in their shampoo that's also found as a food ingredient. So SLS is used as a food additive in some products like marshmallows, dried eggs, though it is banned in the European Union. So you could eat SLS, although I'd probably try to avoid it or at least minimize it since it is still toxic in very high doses. Unfortunately, SLS is much more toxic to sea animals than land animals. The LD50 is as low as 0.001 milligrams per liter of water for some sea creatures. So water pollution with SLS could cause significant negative effects on the ocean and river life forms. So health effects aside, there are some serious ethical and environmental concerns with excessive SLS consumption. Anyways, let's get back to some of the other claims made about SLS. Other claims are that SLS built up in the bloodstreams or in the organs, or that it causes hormonal changes, mutations, or developmental defects. However, there is no evidence to support any of those claims. That is just fear-mongering. But this is a hair loss channel, so I'm sure what you tunes are most interested in here is what effects it has on hair growth. Well, rat studies using SLS showed deposits of SLS on the skin surface and in hair follicles, and these deposits could theoretically damage the hair follicles and inhibit hair growth. However, there are no studies suggesting that SLS actually causes hair loss, so perhaps this is just a situation where not enough SLS is found in shampoo for it to actually damage the hair follicles. Finally, since SLS is in toothpaste and mouthwash, what are its benefits and risk in that situation? This article has a complete literature review on the subject, but let me summarize the findings. The positives are that SLS helps eliminate oral bacteria and increases fluoride absorption into the teeth. The negatives are that it can increase how long it takes for mouth wounds to heal, including canker sores, and just like with skin irritation, it can potentially cause mouth irritation as well. So that pretty much wraps up all the research on SLS. A lot of the quotes I use are from review articles funded by the companies with a vested interest in SLS production, and they naturally put a positive spin on its benefits and they downplay its toxicity, just like how there are companies that sell SLS-free products that exaggerate the dangers of SLS while downplaying the benefits of SLS as a cleaning product. So what do I conclude from all this, and what kind of shampoos do I actually use personally? Well, overall, I don't think that SLS needs to be avoided completely as an ingredient in shampoos. It makes a nice foam, and it probably cleans better than shampoos without it. I think it is a benign product as far as hair growth goes. I don't think it actually improves hair growth or hurts it one way or the other, but I must admit that I am still pretty intrigued about whether or not it might enhance the effect of topical minoxidil by improving its absorption. That would make it similar to something like microneedling without all the risk of constantly traumatizing your scalp and causing scar tissue formation. I think the big negatives of SLS have nothing at all to do with your hair. It's rather the fact that it is made from palm oil, which has many ethical problems associated with it. Also, I think it is a big problem that wastewater with SLS in it might be very bad if it pollutes our rivers and our oceans. Practically speaking, I do use SLS-based shampoos, including a Perithion zinc shampoo daily, as well as a ketoconazole shampoo maybe once or twice per week. That would be this. This is just generic 1% Nizerol. The 2% variation is available prescription only, but I find it's way too harsh for my scalp, so I just use the 1%. And even this one is pretty drying, so I don't like to use this one very frequently. But this thing definitely knocks the hell out of my dandruff, so I do like it. Uh, but ethically speaking, especially as a vegan, you may think it is a bit hard for me to try to justify using SLS since it could contain palm oil. But fortunately, palm oil is just one possible source, and it is possible to make it from other sources like petroleum and coconut oil, or it can even be synthesized directly in a laboratory. So it is possible that not very much palm oil is used in the production of SLS, although I don't know for certain. Other than that, I think SLS is pretty harmless, although I think the derivative of SLS, specifically SLES, sodium laureth sulfate, is potentially more dangerous since it could contain the possibly carcinogenic 1,4-dioxane, though most likely the levels that are found from this carcinogen are probably pretty low due to regulations of products containing SLES. 
So this video was interesting for me to research because if you guys watch my channel, you know I have pretty polemic takes. I usually decide something is either really bad or really good, but in this case, I think the data is mixed. I think there are downsides to SLS and especially SLES, but the downsides have nothing to do with hair and the downsides in general aren't dramatic enough to warrant avoiding the product completely. Although if somebody did want to avoid SLS and SLES, I wouldn't blame them for it. So this is one of the few issues where I kind of agree with the crunchy moms, but if someone wants to use these sulfates, then that's okay too. All right. I think that's it for today, Chooms, but I got another video coming very soon. So I'll see you all next time, Hair Loss Witchers. Thank you for watching. God bless.